And that's all very well and good in that you take your own experiences and you then fill them out with text. So um, we could say, okay, well, let's, if I was going to put that into a basic term, let's evoke a sense of space and a, a sense of place. So if I want to tell you about this lecture theatre or something like that, we're all sat in here. If I gave you a piece of paper, you could write down about what was in here, what it looked like, what it smelled like, what the light was like. But sometimes you can cut a, a dodge on these things, and this is definitely a piece I nicked from, uh, from what I did last year. It was a dark forest full of brambles that pulled on, on your woolen cape. So it instantly evokes a sense of forest full of brambles and spiky things, and it's going to be dark and all the rest of it. An apple orchard in neat rows with the smell of freshly cut grass. Open woodland, or a forgotten coppice full of twisted trees, or one I put jotted down here. A neat little cove surrounded by steep black rock, only accessible by <coughs> flight. Fluttershy met her contact in the mouth of the cave. You don't need to say yellow pegasus, and that's one of the interesting things about writing um, for like MLP fanfics. So if I just grab Applejack out of here, I mean, what don't you guys already know about little AJ? Absolutely everything. As soon as you say AJ, it's like an automatic hyperlink to something in your brain that's all the files on her. Possibly even some of the fanfic stuff. So you don't need to say an awful lot about her unless you're deviating away from the original MLP script on her. So you might say, um, Applejack goes to the bank and then start describing that. But you've automatically saved half the work you need to because it's already been done for you. And that's one of the nice things about fan fictions. As soon as you get into writing about your OC and your OC is an anthro cat, then you've got to lay absolutely everything out. So that's a massive dodge you've cut there. The next one is that you can, uh, you can go and find narrators because, because a particular fandom is a particular way. Chances are that people will be doing art, they'll be doing writing, they'll be doing all sorts of things, and you'll be able to find voice actors. So, it must be three, four people do very good Apple Jacks. Uh, Lost Narrator actually sounds like Apple Jack, um, the more drunk she gets. <laughs> so, she's just brilliant. I've got parts from her where she sounds like Apple Jack automatically. But your next problem is going to be, yes, there are narrators out there, you can really do some good things. If you've got a good story and they like it, you can really up your game very, very quickly from a text story to a narration. But the first problem you're going to have is how to lay that out so that they understand it. So, let's have a quick look what I've got in notes. Um, yeah, I don't think, uh, I think we can compare, I think it's time to compare, <coughs> leading into that is to compare, compare text with narration, with sort of video film, which is the difference between you writing a story about here, telling somebody about, uh, about what happened here, and replaying the video that was taken of here. So, uh, I've got a squirrel in here, if I can just get it. Right, found the squirrel, he hasn't bitten me. Right, okay then, who fancy a bit of describing, right? Can you describe one thing about this squirrel? It's an ordinary British squirrel. Uh, no idea. Yeah? Fancy a go, Logan? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably got a bushy tail. It's got a bushy tail, right. It's probably going to be grey. Not many red squirrels about. Could say it had big eyes. Well, it's probably going to actually have small eyes. Because it's basically a rat with a fluffy with a bog brush tail, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know. So it's going to be basically cute. So we go to, the, go to the document and we start writing. Uh, in Idris's bag, there was a squirrel. It had, you know, a squeaky nose, fluffy tail, uh, grey, classical squirrel. You're going to describe a lot about a squirrel to make it um, actually run in your story, <coughs> depending on what you want, to wear, want that squirrel to do. The squirrel was wearing a bright green waistcoat. The squirrel had a hat at a jaunty angle. Um, the squirrel had its tail in a plastic bag because it was raining outside and he didn't want his tail to get wet. <laughs> There's the sort of things you're going to put in. That's the sort of thing that you automatically can ditch all that if you've got a film or a cartoon or a video. 
because on comes Mr. Squirrel in his hat, in his waistcoat, with his plastic bag on his tail, it's raining, you know exactly what's going on. You could describe the rain. So that's the first thing a, a, about it, is that, oh no, here is Mr. Squirrel, he, he looks quite different to, uh, quite different to uh, the, actual, the actual description we had. That's the snag, it's not a real squirrel, it's a, it's a toy squirrel. And uh, he's, he's quite cute. So if I get the squirrel here and I go, okay, so, okay, he's surprised. He's, uh, oh, he's, he's a bit shy. Uh, he's waving to everybody. He, he's happy to see you all. You would have to write all that into your story. How does that squirrel feel? Visually, you can see what the squirrel's like. He's got googly eyes. One of the snags is that when you're writing to your, um, you're getting narrators to come in, they're going to, you're going to have to try and explain to those, them what you kind of want that squirrel to be like. And that's where your casting comes in. So chances are, if you're like me, you don't know a million different people, you're going to grab the first people going. But you all kind of want to have the same sentiment, the same thing. So it's best to give them the whole story and then to highlight their whole lines. So if I give the lines of the squirrel to you, then I will highlight all your lines in, say, green. All the lines for the, the dog that's going to chase the squirrel, all his lines are in red. Admittedly, they might just be woof, 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 bark, <laughs> you know, get out of my yard. <clears throat> so that's how you lay it out to give it to the actual narrator. That's the first part of actually communicating with them. So hopefully, after a week or three months or six months, all those things will come together. But you also want to do the backstory. So you'll say, uh, Mr. Squirrel went to the shops, and then Mr. Squirrel says, oh, hello, uh, I, I'd like some Jaffa cakes, please. So you've got somebody reading a story, and that brings you off into two advantage, two things there. You can be doing a read out story with voices like your mum reads for a bedtime story, or you can be doing more like a radio play. I've had a look at the radio play, that's what people like Obab Scribble who really know what they're doing, I'd leave that well alone. <laughs> but your basic narration, you can build it pretty quick. Now, the first thing that's going to sort of, sort of kick your butt a bit is that when you do that, uh, that document, you're going to describe something in words that you can get away with, but you wouldn't get away with in a narration. So one thing I've been caught out on is saying doors too often. But it's very tricky in a made-up environment to get around these things. So you can cheat by saying, oh, um, they went up to the, to the ancient gate and opened it and, and a door somewhere else. It's just one of those things if you constantly say, she said, he said, the, 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 it's going to sound weird when you read it out. So if you do a story and you read it as a story, so if you read that document there in the book, it reads okay. But would it read okay if you were trying to read it out? So if you're editing your own work, have a read through it. Yeah, all the spelling mistakes are gone. Does it, uh, does it flow right? Does it say what you want to say? Is there anything missing? Then go and find somebody uh, who can read through it and see if there's enormous bits missing. That's quite important. Rosie does my bit where it's like, where did that come from? That, that wasn't anywhere before. Where did that character come from? It's like somebody suddenly somebody drops cadence into the plot line. It's like, where did, where, there's an alley corner from nowhere. Where did that come from? So, but you can have a nice, gentle pace. If you're going to make it run on YouTube, you want a faster pace. So you are physically going to have to go through that entire story and re-edit it. And this is where it comes about, where I said about, um, I've got in my notes here, about a screenplay. When you see in a movie that somebody's done the screenplay of a book, and sometimes the original person likes it so much that they won't even have the name on the credits, that's what kind of happens. It gets changed to be a film, it gets changed to be a narration. <laughs> So I've been criticised in the past by uh, Present Perfect on Film Fiction for not, uh, not having enough pace or various criticisms, but one of them was, oh, you haven't got enough pace, you've got too much pace in your story, it runs too quickly, slow down, fill it out. 
I didn't because I'd written it for YouTube and chucked it on Film Fiction. As soon as you narrate it and put it on YouTube, it runs great. It runs exactly the speed that you need to. So, because you haven't got to describe a squirrel in quite the same way, you're only going to talk about the squirrel. He's a brown squirrel with a squeak. You can cut a lot of words out. That then gives your story more pace and people who are more inclined to listen to it on YouTube. The other thing that you can have on there is that I've got to try and describe his squeak in a text document. So I'll say the, the squirrel squeaked. Uh, that's fair enough, everybody knows what a squeak sounds like. If you've got the narration, you can record that and put it in. The same goes for engine noises, rain, thunderstorm, the sound of leaves in trees, all of these things you can use to set a scene. And at the same time, if you're going to say in your story, the leaves were rustling in the trees, as soon as you convert that to something you're going to send to the narrators or read yourself, don't put it in, cut it out. Cut out anything where he said, she said, because if you've got powerful voice actors like, say, Lost Narrator, Wooten, various other ones, if you took those all into a story, once you've introduced those at the beginning, you can literally just have the basic narration for the story and just have them put in there. You don't need to say so much that he said, she said. You can start to cut a lot of things out. So what you might see is that, let's say your story is in text form, it's a thousand words. You'll probably bring that down to, say, 800 words for YouTube. But when you're sending it out to the narrators and you put, say, notes on there, Apple Jack is angry here, Apple Jack is sad here, you know, Apple Jack's in a strong wind here, you'll probably fill it back out with stage notes. And stage notes can be something very useful just to say to people what you're thinking of. If you're feeling confident enough, I would say it's worthwhile recording the whole thing yourself, edit it, and then send that file to somebody that you want to narrate it as well, because they're, you're always going to get asked for three lines. You always ask for three lines, and you do it in um, three different ways, really. So how can I describe that as in, um, Mr. Squirrel went to the shops. Mr. Squirrel went to the shops. Mr. Squirrel went to the shops. They will then, whoever edits that story, will then pick out one of those three lines that best suits the situation. It may be that you get asked again for another version, and that's where it gets tricky, that's where it gets time consuming. I would say that the problem with a text story is that you're going to write all your story, you're going to edit it, and I think anybody, everybody in this room is going to do some sort of art or some sort of creative thing where you're going to get to a point where you're either going to put it on the back burner or you're just going to ship it out to wherever it's going so you're going to stick it on a forum or whatever. But at some point you're going to have to call it one way or the other. As finished, chuck it out the door. You're going to have to do exactly the same thing with the, the narration. When that audio file gets to a certain point, chuck it out on YouTube and that's nothing to worry about. You're going to do some good ones, you're going to do some bad ones, you're going to do some brilliant ones, you're going to do some fun ones. Just keep, keep putting content out there. Because you can spend a lot of time on one YouTube video, and you might spend too much time on it, and it will only be as good as that. If you just get to, say, 90% through, you're well happy with it, you know you've got more on it, but it's going to take hours, ship it, move on to the next one, because every time you do a writing piece, or a YouTube piece, or a cartoon piece, you're always going to get better every time. So don't get bogged down in the detail, chuck it out there, move on to the next one, and that way you can keep moving along. Uh, the other one I've got here is how long to read a book versus watch a film. How long to watch all the Harry Potters, how long to read all the Harry Potters. That's a classic example of where stuff's got ripped out left, right and centre to make it bobble along quite nicely on a film. Otherwise it's going to be like something three hours like Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, what you say in a story might not translate. Just look out for various pitfalls when you're reading it out. Um, yeah, the human brain spots a lot of repetitive words. 
So you need a door opening, creaking hinges, swung open. Classic example. The creak, creaking hinges um, is something you can automatically cut out because you just have you're putting a squeaky door noise. And on sites like SFX and that, there's plenty of free sound effects that you can just pop in there and automatically slim your your story down. There's background noise even, so that's quite surprising if you go in. Oh, um, Twilight and AJ are sat in a, a cafe. You can really bring that scene to a life in the way that you can't in the text by having that sound of people in the background. Uh, experimentation in general is how you keep interested. Yeah, a classic one is never go for a multi-chapter, multi-VA story first off. In the same way that you shouldn't do that in writing, you should consider if you're going to jump from text on, say, film fiction to um, a, an actual narration with a title card on Vigna or YouTube. Okay, so you start off the beginning, you do a few poems, you do a few stories, you move on to a multi-chapter, you've got a piece of, say, 8,000 words. Don't try and narrate that one. Go right back to the beginning. Narrate something simple, then work your way back up to a, a multi-chapter, multi-VA thing, because you can do a poem, narrate it yourself, and edit it. You can probably do that in a day, if you've really got the, the thing for it that day. You just wake up one morning and go, right, poem today, let's have it. You can easily be six months to a year doing a multi-chapter, uh, multi-VA piece. That's just how it's going to come out. The other thing is, I suppose, is what does your target audience like to listen to? Um, is it just your mates? I, I really like um, audio work, um, being dyslexic. Logan's very good at um, uh, reading and writing. Uh, he actually prefers to read it rather than listen to it. We're two opposite sides of the coin. We cross over, but that's kind of the way it is. Um, what's your target audience you, you're going to aim for? But if you do text and narration, you can hit both, which is quite nice. Uh, yeah, there's something I said here about it. It's worth just chucking into the hole. Uh, initial idea and title don't fit anymore. Junk them and move on. Sometimes an idea is just a missing link to a better story. I think um, somebody said yesterday, I think it was... Uh, I think it might have been Mad Munchkin. I can't remember who said yesterday. But start off... Um, there's no problem starting off with the end. That's my yeah, there's no problem starting off with the beginning. I like to have a bit of an idea, oh, this might turn out like that. One of the biggest mistakes I've made is starting off not having a great idea and starting off at the beginning. Oops, I don't know where I'm going. And if I don't know where I'm going, I can't ever get there. So if you've got some idea about where that story's going to finish, where it's going to start, write it, fill out the middle, hate the end, and junk it, write a new ending. There's no problem with taking one concept and going two different ways. And that's absolutely true of uh, the narration as well. If you're doing a piece and you're like, nah, I don't know if this is really coming together, uh, don't be afraid to drastically change your text to fit what you want to do, or just junk it and move on to another story. Because you want to enjoy it, not make it a chore. And anything that just grinds and grinds and grinds and you're trying to put it together, yeah, you're not really going to finish that, and when you get to the end, your heart's not going to be in it. You want to keep that passion into it to, to keep it real and, and make it a nice piece. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that is the, um, the difference between text, um, YouTube and Vidme, and actually moving up to cartoons. So, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going for the full hour, I should have warned you about that one. Because <laughs> there's something else next door, isn't there? There's, uh... <coughs> yeah, fictional sto story panel next door in a bit. Yeah? Yeah, do you know where I can find um, like voice actors where you would be a good place to start to find someone? Twitter's pretty good. Twitter. Hang around on the forums, depends what level you're after. Um, the, the time is your thing, so it's going to probably take you 12 months to find a, a sort of selection of people. I mean, what we've got going on at the minute has been going on since May 2016, and we have half of the voice actors that we need. Yeah. One of them can do a really good Twilight Sparkle. Uh, we have the rarity as well. 
um, but we just need a few others. So rapidly great problems and the animate as well is another thing. Um, but that sounds like quite a big project. It is. It yeah. is yeah. very big, but you know, I've mixed up quite a lot yes. from what you've yeah. said, just from right. you know, when yeah. you're starting yeah. from something small to something big, and moving from text to animation and that great. You can see how mentally advanced series came to be changing all the voices around. So in that case, they brought out the extremes of the characters and gave them male voices. Um, so um, obviously, Triple Threat is, okay. is, is very meek and mild. And what I like, very much alpha male in your face. So it, 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 it is one of those things where to fill out all of those parts will be very difficult. But it's been pointed out before, yeah, you might get stick for having somebody who doesn't seem to sound exactly like Twilight Sparkle or Rainbow Dash, but I wouldn't be afraid to knock that on the head. As long as they sound roughly like them, yeah, and yeah, they yeah, move yeah. and act like them. We're not looking for yeah. total perfection. Yeah. No. Um, in the entire thing, so, you know, there's a lot of, there is a lot of work room, yeah. Like, um, yeah, you're going to have to go and find a friend of a friend of a friend and trawl through um, uh, MLP um, forums. Okay. Um, there's uh, Equestria UK. Just trawl all through those forums and have a, a sniff about. But I'd also go onto YouTube, find any video that has characters in that you want, and hopefully they'll list in listings of who the person is. So you can say, okay, well, uh, Scribble will play that part. The problem is that the better people get, the busier that they are, and it's not like they're high ranking or anything like that. It's just that they tend to get incredibly busy in a lot of projects and they can be very difficult to get. So I would tend to give a first, try out a few first timers. Okay. Yeah, because everybody started somewhere and there's no reason to assume they aren't very good. And even if they're not, they might get better as they go on. Yeah. 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 But you've, yeah. you've got to aim incredibly low and just work up from there. Um, but there are some nice hidden away people. Uh, Ilya Linov. He's very good. He kicks around with uh, Scribbler and Losty and those guys. Okay. Uh, he just does it for a bit of fun. He'll only pick up the ones he kind of likes. But he's a really nice guy to deal with. And he doesn't, he isn't in the mainstream, so he's not massively busy. And he isn't yeah, the only person in that line of work. You'll find people sort of around the periphery um, doing stuff. But certainly, yeah, anybody you can put the line together, I'd, I'd chuck them in. Yeah. Animators, no idea. I haven't uh, any animation I've done myself so far, but yeah. 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 I mean, title cards, I have done some. Uh, I normally do a photograph title card for some of mine, that's dead quick. Um, Thomas in Ponyville, dead simple. Got Twilight, got Thomas Tank Engine, photographed them on the whole floor, away you go. All the way out to the Joey Bean one, which is just simply gorgeous with sea ponies on, um, depending on what you feel. But I think you can do quite a bit with titles with cards. I've seen where you just go from one card to another card to another one, and you set the scene out like that, and then you zoom in and zoom out. That seems to be an incredibly good way of getting the best of both. It was meant to be narration, like a radio screenplay. Yeah. Um, and what, what turned out was an animation. And so me and my friend had a misunderstanding. We started with a joke. It was a joke. Yeah. And we came with this idea. We thought, oh, wow, this sounds really good. Um, and then when Ed sent the script, it was an hour and a half long. Mm, um, yeah. And I was like, mm, I was expecting that. <laughs> was and, and this is what happens, yeah. And that's exactly like multi, multi chapter, multi VA. Yeah. 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 You, don't wanna, you don't wanna kick your own book before you can get going. But um, it's either that or you're in like um, lullaby for a, a lullaby for a princess. Yes. Which is what was it? Two years? I think it was three actually. Yeah, it could easily have been three. I know there's, yeah. there's three years. months for a few seconds, isn't there? When I just learned yeah. on lullaby for a princess. Um, come here, my children. That's from a 1993 Disney film. I'll be yeah. Focused. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The um, witch, uh, the, yeah, the, the, main, the main witch on it. Yeah. Uh, that's right, because they don't know whether uh, Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe wrote the final. Um, there's three sort of verses in it, isn't there? He wrote two, and they don't know about the third one. I don't know. And uh, the little guys say he didn't, and everybody else thinks he did. But hey, he could have jotted down a fag packet, who knows? I mean, you always think of these things as being dead professional. And yeah, they are dead professional, but there's a lot of stuff people just down the pub going, hey, what if we. You know, and we've done it at work with stuff. You, you just suddenly have an idea, and you go, 
ah, nuts, what did we think of that earlier? Because I mean, it's not through a process. I was, I was watching that film, and when I saw those children following the witches, and I thought, hang on, that yeah. reminds me of Yeah, it's from Hocus yeah. Pocus, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Children of the Night. Oh, the Luna taking the children away. Yeah. yeah. I love that one. A real thing to matter. Mum hates it. It's very good. <laughs> so, um, who have we got in, in the audience then? Who writes then? Oh, quite a few then, yeah. The thing is, I, I, I'm trying to. I've got a YouTube channel. Yeah. And I'm trying to make my own studio for the um, Somebody A production. Um, I just yeah. can't. I just can't put it together at the moment with the voicing. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing yeah. uh, a story based on Starlight. Yeah. And I'm also got another story that. Means, yeah. Know, yeah. So. Um, and you're and you're VA as well. I'm a VA as well. I'm a VA. So there you are. So, so you could easily hook up with him. I was just thinking, yeah. my, 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 like constant tumbling into that. Direction. Yeah, that's literally yeah. it. Because apparently the best characters I can do are Big Mac, Big Mac. Oh, right, um, okay. the mm. I prefer oh, the right. Doctor. <laughs> so we always send this to the new Napoli and get a little bit of catch up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we get people, we, we, uh, we, some mates at work have just been out to the, um, the Solvay um, knock-a-lock course in Germany for, for brazing. And there's people go over a year and you think, well, surely you know everything about brazing and fluxes yeah. that you would need yeah. to know. But they're going there to network, not to get the course. Yeah. And that's the other thing, that's how you also, come to do it. I'm a I'm an audio engineer for my investigations. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, nice one. Yeah. So who here is, uh, so we've got YouTubers and we've got, um, uh, we've got writers. writers. Yeah. Who's thinking about going from one to the other? Or who's sort of struggling from going from one to the other? It's harder to write than voice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I quite like the writing. I don't mind the sound of my own voice. But <laughs> yeah, you've got, got, you got matching the voices as well. The thing it's is, you, I, I yeah. want my work to be on. Um, yeah. You, yeah, because yeah. Um, my friend Mark here has uh, a story called The Unknown Cutie Mark. Yeah. That's uh, got his title card on it and it's got voices on it of, of the characters. Yeah. Yeah. And right, I, I don't want that for mine as well. But finding the artist is even harder. <laughs> and it, it takes ages. Yeah. yeah. But I, I do love the idea that you can take massive, massive liberties with um, the Brony fandom, which initially started out as sort of, the, the Brony started out as a Mickey take of MLP, and then gradually became more of it. But when you actually look at the cartoon and you watch all the throwbacks to um, Tex Avery, oh, and, uh, yeah. that, that one where uh, Twilight drinks hot stuff sauce. That's thank you. Uh, oh, oh, that one. Yeah, yeah. the beginning. That, that's classic Tex Avery. And then we've had scenes from various films. We've had scenes from... We had a Bugs Bunny trick. Oh, I Love that. Lucy. Yeah. Bugs Bunny trick of being up pinky going under rocks. Shrek. And, uh, that, that, because it's... That's the, the tomatoes. The tomatoes. Hmm? Shrek. When she changes into the alicorn. Yeah. There's, yeah. yeah. There's all sorts of different rip-offs in there. And just because of that... It well, means that they're mentally it's like advanced. References. It's yeah, references. it means a mentally advanced series and things like that fit straight in there. Yeah. And that's something that's very nice about the fandom, is that Applejack can be almost anything. Um, but she is a little silly pony, still. <laughs> she, 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 she was eating footage from G1. Though, <laughs> G1. So, yeah. So you're going to do the kids' custom ponies. No grab, problem. I'll, yeah. grab, I'll grab you later if I can because she's just starting out. She's got a bit shy for her. That's but, all right. But, well, she's got a YouTube channel and she's getting really good at writing. Brilliant. So we just need to kind of know what apps to use to start making stories. And we're trying to do voiceovers for stuff as well. She's yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. I mean, the, 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 the Yeti microphone is a classic. Stick it on a, um, a tea tray so it doesn't pick up all the sounds. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Yeti, the, a good mic, I think it's 80, 20, 20. Is a, is a very good mic. Um, the first time I fired up the Yeti, uh, Blue Yeti, um, kicked it up and I could hear Rosie upstairs and I thought, wow, that's an amazing microphone. And I thought, oh hell, is it? Because if it can pick up noises that far away, then is it going to pick up everything in the room? And it mm -hmm. does, twen does tend to, so I think Yeti's about 80 quid, 70 quid, might get as low as 60. Uh, snow the Snowball is also a very good Stop. Yeah, yeah. Snowball's a good starter. And this is the thing though, because what happens is that it's something that Rosie said to me, yeah. is that you can buy 
something like a snowball, then you have to go and buy, you think, okay, that's, I've outlasted that. You can flog it on eBay, but then you go and buy a Yeti. Well, then you bought a Snowball and a Yeti. Are you better off to go and buy a Yeti or an AT2020? You probably don't need to go up to um, very high standards. I think if you're over 100 quid, you've got to be awful sure you're going to go into it. Mm-hmm. Or you've got mates who've got a band that you or can make lots of work. I use a mixer. Yeah, a mixer would be good. Um, I sold a normal microphone that worked as well. Oh, like a headset? Yeah, they do. Well, not, not, not a headset, but a microphone microphone. Oh, yeah, that would yeah, be absolutely fine. They what you want to do is to get to. either side of. Yeah. A good microphone, a good voice microphone, as opposed to a, sort of a good band microphone. It, you, you look at it, and the way it will be built inside, it'll pick up a certain range of sound. So it'll be a little bit either side of um, what, you can, uh, what you can hear. Um, it's one of the reasons why. If you talk, try and talk to your dog down the telephone, the dog's going to be horribly confused mm-hmm. because your telephone literally only picks up enough of your sound waves to work. It's one of the reasons why telephones are reliable. You actually grab quite a narrow band. If you take something like the Yeti, it's got a hell of a range. The advantage of the Yeti is I took mine to work with my wife's laptop, ran it till the battery went flat at work, just making recording sound effects. So I was like metal doors, a punch press working, mm-hmm. compressor starting, fans working. I just literally just wandered around the factory turning machines on and off. It's very, very good at that. You'll get a very, very good sound quality. The disadvantage is that uh, I made the mistake of putting it onto um, uh, a basket, um, like a laundry basket. Put it on there, did a recording with mum, and it's just like... All the way through, I couldn't hide it with fire noises. There's nothing I could do. We had to jump the file and go back. Um... The other one that's quite a good pop filter, if you've got yeah. a pop filter on there, that's brilliant. Um, Audacity has uh, Audacity, the free download program for sound editing. Yeah. You can do an awful lot with that, and one of the things you can do is mess around with the frequencies. So you get like a graph, and uh, it's like amplitude against frequency, and you move the line around, and basically, if you've got like a noise in there, or, or Sammy Snakes, you can change that curve to take out those high and low frequency noises and just grab that telephone band of noise. It won't get you around a bad mic, but it will get you around a good mic that's picked up something it shouldn't. And the other one is, I, I, I found, this may be true of this, it may not be, but if that's on the table, if you're holding that, that's pretty well insulated. Yeah. If you put it on the table and go like that, it picks, uh, it, it, picks up. it picks it up really, really well. And that's true of the... Um, and uh, the noise, Yeti. Noise reduction as well. Yeah, noise reduction is good. Yeah, always record um, five seconds of nothing. Just sit there quietly twiddling your thumbs, trying to make not any noise. Uh, Audacity is absolutely brilliant at taking out fridges. If it's got a constant 50 hertz noise on it, just to take that nothing noise as a sample, apply it to the whole sound, sound file, and it's just gone. It's mad. It's like it, it was never there. You can be, you can listen to the soundtrack. There's a fridge in the background. The flight was just gone, and you wouldn't know it was ever there. For a free program, it's absolutely stunning at that. But what's annoying about voicing is that when words begin with C, sometimes you get the real. <laughs> yeah, that and like your pop voicing. filter will help you with that, considering yeah. how cheap they are. If you've got that microphone on a flexible stand with a rubber band mount and a pop filter on it. That would save you so much editing. It really will. You'd be just streets ahead compared to what you could be with the sound editing. Yeah. And better mics are better at it. I guess the stuff above the, 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 the AT2020 and stuff above that is just better at pulling people's sound voices and not recording next door starting their car or the birds outside. Or but, in traffic. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said for... Um, I've seen people making... Um, <laughs> they get a big cardboard box, yeah, that's on the floor, line it with foam, put the microphone in it, and that's their recording that, that studio. That was one of Scribbler's advice. Yeah, she that, built that one box. in Australia, didn't she? Yeah. I saw that. And, yeah. and she literally went down there, got a big limby, lined <laughs> it, and that was that was her recording for because the, the like was it Goala? Golars. Golars, yeah, Golars and all sorts down there. And they just go all day long and all night. Golars. Yeah. Golars. Yeah. Golars. 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 And that'll really help you out. There's the stuff like uh, in here, we've got a really good echo. It's, it's got the same <laughs> ceiling, but we've got 
I don't know what you're getting your end, but I've got a, a flat wall directly opposite me. Anything that's going out that way is going to bounce off that wall, that wall, okay, that wall, nice, and nice, come back nice, to me. Yeah. And straight against that wall mm. and back again. So you finish up with that, uh, why does a duck's quack have no echo kind of thing, because it's its own echo, but I'm really getting it sat here. Yeah, I think, it tells out about the noise, but it's, it's, it would be awful for recording, unless you wanted to do a recording in a mine. So you said, okay, uh, AJ's in a mine, go pick an environment that's in a mine, because you know, it, like an empty garage or something like that, it'll save you a lot of editing time. The only snag is that, with this game, is that it doesn't matter how good you are, you'll find that all the people you get for narrators will have different microphones and different sound levels. It's very, very interesting that you can pick one person, so let's say uh, Wooten, or, and say, I'm going to say, narrator pony's got quite an, a loud, uh, got quite a prominent voice. And with as well. Yeah, but there, if you if you look at the sound level, so okay, you've got the zero line, maximum, you're going to have Wooten and Nairat Pony coming in at exactly the same level, or myself, but you are going to have to um, half the decibels on Wooten because he's got a very punchy voice. So when you listen to the track, unless you want it suddenly to go, people, 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 Wooten, people, 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 you are going to have to bring that sound level right down. Because another, another problem what, is... What about Silver Trail? Continuity! Yeah, it, it depends how soft people's voice and where they're from. You imagine a New York accent versus, you know, a down south accent for a beer. Down south? What are you talking about, uh, boy? But, and Loss is quite low as well. Yeah, Loss and Irish. Yeah, she only really blasts out uh, Asia. A bit raspy as well. Oh, brilliantly raspy. Yeah. Yeah, I've got her uh, playing uh, Tigger in Tigger's Tank. And in parts of that she sounds so much like AJ, it's brilliant. Um, that was the other thing, is sound. When you come into, you've also got your sound effects, so obviously you've got Mr. Squirrel, Mr. Squirrel comes on board. Um, what? If you're going to have a sound of, a soundtrack in the background, just be careful of how loud you make it, because I noticed this is going to sound a bit ageist, and it, it probably is. Younger people have got better ears, they can hear more frequencies. If they make a video, they tend to have a louder soundtrack on it, so music background. Because I'm older, I can hear less, and I'm dyslexic, and I struggle to process words anyway. If it's got a if it's got a poor voice quality and a loud soundtrack, music track, that doesn't work for me at all. I just can't follow it. So we have to. I have to like just move on to the next one. So you want sometimes you want a hint of music. So if you are building a sound file, and I usually ship them into Sony Vegas or something like that, because that's great for putting title cards in and messing around with the sound locally. You can put. Uh, a lot of these programs are identical. You've got your stereo track there, uh, you've got video there, title card there, and they all go down the page like that. It's worth having it so that if you get a quite bit of text, quite a bit of narration, just put some points in and just dip your background music down. If Ideally, you want to line up your background music so that a quiet bit comes for a quiet bit of the scene. That's great if you, if you can just ring up a bloke and say, oh yeah, I need some music for this please, I'm doing a remake of E.T. And he'll just write you a piece of music that fits the whole bill. You're probably going to have to dip it, raise it. So if you get an exciting bit, raise the whole volume and the whole piece for a bit. Raise the music up a bit. But be careful of washing out your narration with sound effects and background music. It's very easily done. I suppose the last thing I should mention is fixes. As soon as you get a piece back from a narrator, if you look at it straight away and give it a really good listening to, and make sure there's no mistakes in it. Because if you need to have a re-record and fix a mistake, you need to grab them as soon as possible. The first thing you need to grab them is while they're still interested, and you want to grab them before they change microphones or recording rooms. Or, let's say next week they go and buy a wardrobe, they could drastically change the, the way they record in that one room and you want it all to be sequential. Because even if you're recording yourself, it can be difficult to chop it all together. You want to do it at the same time, in the same environment. That'd be uncool. Mm. Even doing it yourself, you can, you can do, how I said about doing three lines. You do it slowly, excitable, some other form. You can find you're doing that, and sometimes you're trying to splice something back together, and you just get so addled in your head, you want to get like lever fever. Just walk away from it, go and have a cup of tea and a biscuit, 
leave it for an hour, then come back to it and give it another listen. Because sometimes you might go, yeah, that's not so bad, nobody's going to notice. But I would. This is an interesting thing. If you're actually an audio engineer by trade... Yeah. No, no, I'm well, I'm sorry. But you, you've almost ruined a hobby of listening to stories by being an audio... Uh, as an engineer, I've got a thing called angleitis. Yeah. Uh, I can tell where anything is off by a degree in the room and it'll yeah. bug me. Because uh, I'm designing things, I'm trying to make them square. Listen for background audio as well. Yeah, same with visuals. You just, yeah. you know, if you're if you're a film producer, and you're watching a film. You're just going to sit there and analyse it all the way through. You're not going to enjoy the film like the rest of us do. Yeah. No. Uh, and that's where you can get stuck. But yeah, the main idea of it is to have fun. So, like I say, don't go too deep into it. If you get to a certain point, just kick it up on YouTube and go for it. Uh, the session should have started now. Yeah. It's past 7 Yeah. No, it's 10. Oh, is it? What is it? No. Nearly quarter to 11. 10 o'clock it started. Yeah, you missed yeah. the first half hour. I didn't know. Oh. <laughs> that's why the last 10 minutes, that's why the, the, this last 10 minutes hasn't made a lot of sense because you, you kind of missed all the beginning. Ah, oh, I missed it. Yeah, I know something about <laughs> Yeah, it's a continuation from last year. So is everybody sort of happy that there's a difference? Yeah. As much as anybody cares. <laughs> but, it, but if you know there's a difference, sometimes that's, I could have just come in here and said, hey, if there's a difference between writing text and doing narrations, and you would have had enough of a sniff of it to know, well, well or something like that. Narration yeah, because you have yeah. to actually be in the narrative. Yeah. I think you do that when you write it, don't you? When you write it as well, though. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, um, whenever you're writing about, we've been I mean, writing I mean, about Sweetie Dad, you've got to be a bit. Anyway. Hmm? You have to do that when you're a BA anyway. So. Yeah. But when you VA, I prefer to see the script, I don't know what sort of voice to put on. Yeah. It's difficult to imagine without a script. It, yeah. it depends how good you are as well. Uh, uh, a friend of ours was working with a lady who plays cello. She's so good at cello, she doesn't write pieces, but she's so good at the actual cello, she can be playing it and talking about where she's going on holiday. Octavia. So she can play it absolutely beautifully. And <laughs> Scribbler's known for her playing Octavia. <laughs> she's good at that. Yeah, yeah, she's got the voice for it. She says, never underestimate the, um, the effect of being a British voice actor yeah. in America. <laughs> because... Um, to, to listen to Rob Abstrimer in America is to listen to something new, a bit like listening to Lost Narrator here. Yep. Uh, we're exposed to a lot of American voices to the point where, when my dad said, oh, I can't listen to that story of yours, it's got an American actor. It's like, wow, that, that amazes me, it never crossed my mind. You know, I'll do one story with people from three different, four different countries in it. Yeah. It, it, it never crossed my mind that that would ever be a problem. Um, but, you, yeah, if you can appeal to uh, an American audience, and that's going to affect when you put it on YouTube or Vidme or Film Fiction, you would think that you're going to put it on there at, say, uh, say you put it on there Saturday evening. So let's say you put it on 6 o'clock Saturday evening. If you think about it, in America, you're going to hit the people 10 o'clock Saturday morning when they're going out to a baseball practice or whatever they do. So what you really want to be doing is... You shouldn't be not a night owl. You, you should consider actually um, giving it the proper delay, or um, get it uploaded first, and just set your watch for three o'clock um, Sunday morning, and then just make it live at three o'clock Sunday morning somewhere about there. Don't forget as well, America's huge. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so Los Australia. Angeles and California, they're eight hours behind. The other side are only about four or five hours five. behind you. Yeah. So you don't, you, you're going to have to aim a bit average and have a look at your well, daylight saving all well, the rest of it. Well, I'm going to do 11pm and it'll be around five o'clock in USA. Mm. The other thing you can do as well, Fin Fiction, I notice, I know a lot of you guys probably get on Fin Fiction. Uh, I, I, I used to, but... Yeah. yeah. If you're putting a story on there, you could put it on at three o'clock Sunday morning. Your snag is that lots of people, Americans, are putting stuff on there as well. So that story will get buried in minutes. So if you put it on there, and, and this is something I found, it sounds ridiculous, Thursday night is probably a good time to put it on there. So if you're going, if you get a story geared up to go on there Thursday night, 
UK, put it on there about six or seven o'clock at night. I very often get um, favourites on stories, which is way better than likes. Forget likes. Likes are good. Dislikes, just forget them. Because, I mean, who goes up to a story and goes, oh, I don't like that? I mean, then Logan said... Um, the thing is, it kind of gets me down a bit when... No, I don't, because, like Logan says, people will give you a dislike just because it wasn't the story they were expecting. They were looking for a story on Fluttershy. Your story was about Applejack. I don't like that. It, the dislike's literally worthless. Likes are worth something, but if somebody says, oh, a favourite this story, and they put it in their favourites list, or read later, that means that they liked it enough to care about it to watch it later. Because um, one of the dodges that i found is that it... it I do hang off the, um, the apron strings of Lost Narrator and Obab Scribbler because they do have a lot of punch power. So uh, My Little AI has got uh, a thousand views now on Fim Fiction. It would not have that if it hadn't been recorded by the Lost Narrator. You've been very lucky with them though, haven't you? They've really? been really nice people. That's a nice thing. I think a lot of people think that they write to Obab Scribbler and they hear nothing. Exactly. I, I, and it's I, like, I, I, oh, Obab I, Scribbler doesn't like me. No, she obviously she's care. absolutely she so sweet. She cares, yeah. she cares an awful lot. It's she's an unbelievably gets... sweet person. Lost narrator is she the... I know Lost narrator swears a fair amount, but she's a really <laughs> yeah. nice person. So, uh, it's like All of them are. Last a few times, but and she hasn't you've got to imagine, Obab Scribbler gets 50 emails a day, virtually, you know, yeah. Yeah. of people <laughs> asking her questions. And she's got to the point now where she physically can't wade through the emails. So she just has to filter everything out. So to try and get it, to try and lock down over above scribbler to do something, or the lost narrator. Um, and if this is going to sound a bit mean, but if you can catch them at a financial low and get them to do a commission for you, that's not a bad idea. But um, certainly a happy financially work well off the age of the worst to try and get older. <laughs> it's, uh, well, that's true with anybody really. It's, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I love to give. Um, startup artists to go for title cards is that um, you can really do some good and, and I'll say this genuinely if you commission people who are in university who are trying to have a go um, like Mad Munchkin started out on her own a few years ago yeah. if you can help these people by handing them some money for something you want you can really make both your lives better um, so if, if you commission somebody to go to a convention uh, because they're a good artist and they can't afford to go. Think of the people you're going to help. You're going to help them because they're going to uh, a convention. Going to help you because you're going to get some title art from somebody, you know, some work from somebody who's decent. But you're also you're going to help all the people at the convention who would like to meet them. So you can hand over, say, thirty quid, and that thirty quid can go miles and really help. You know, you can almost make a, sort of a, a pound per person happy. And that's really worth the doing. Mm. But, uh, but yeah, it's a, don't think that because somebody doesn't write back to you or ignores you, that's because Keep of some personal thing with it. They just probably haven't yeah. picked it up. It, it's that mm. simple. Because yeah, that is the one thing I'll say about Pony. From the professional VAs like Tara Strong and all those guys, all the way down to the bottom, they're really nice people. I know we get one or two idiots in the fandom who make it look a bit nasty, but they are very, very small in number. And even when I've been ripped off by um, commissions, um, I gave a guy 40 quid for a commission and it never turned up. His brain detonated, there was no two ways about it. He'd had like a bipolar high, I'm gonna do commissions. Boof, completely crashed out. And you can guarantee he feels absolutely awful about it, but there's nothing he can do about it to rectify that. So, yeah, we say it's um, friendship is magic. It's all about forgiveness, but yeah, always lean that way with these things, especially if you're trying to put a big project together. Because if you don't, you will just drive yourself mad and give up. I feel like doing that sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite lucky in that if I get bored of writing, I'll go and do some engineering. So, I just. Like, uh, yeah, it's how do you, you keep motivated? It's good to have a second hobby, isn't it? Yeah, or many, or, you know. And I think this is nice because you can come to PonyCon, you can be a writer, you can be a cosplayer, you can do all of those things, <laughs> but this is some goal to aim for. Um, something you need to get your cosplay done for and in between your writing. And that's how you can make a hobby like this really fun in several different areas. 
Fox, Fox, better shut this down then, because. Um... There you go.